There are very, very few such undergraduate level programs in the entire country. Uh, and the, the caliber of readers we get, the caliber of writers that students get to work with here, really, really awesome. You should, you should feel very special because of this. Uh, the trio's readings tonight and other readings in this, this series this semester, which are all curated by our, our guest writer in residence, are also supported by the English Department, Africana Studies, Spanish and Hispanic Studies, and the Provost's Office, and of course, the bookstore. Thank you so much to Brian for selling books for us. And special thanks to the Trius Administrative Assistant, Sue Gage, without whom everything you see would fall apart immediately <laughs> and irrevocably. Thank you so much, Sue, for holding, it, holding us all together, me most especially. Um, about the reading series, quickly, we have a poster up over here, so you can look at it as I'm talking. We have a sort of Caribbean theme with the two fall Trius readers, including poet Adrian Castro, who will be reading on October 30th, and novelist Christina Garcia, reading on November 20th. I'll send reminders about these as they come up. Uh, I also want you to keep your eye out for some fantastic readings happening in other places around campus. D.T. Max, the biographer of David Foster Wallace, uh, is, is going to be coming to town, Maruta Yanez, who's uh, the first writer actually from Cuba. She's currently Cuban, uh, and she's going to come meet on campus, and Jewish-Canadian memoirist George Ellen Bowden uh, are all on the horizon this semester, so keep an eye out for that. This is a great place to be if you're interested in awesome contemporary writing from people of many and dramatically different backgrounds. So, here we are. Uh, we're thrilled to pieces to be able to welcome novelist, poet, playwright, essayist, screenwriter, TED talker, beloved jack of all trades, Chris Abani, as our writer in residence this year. Wait, there's more. <laughs> Avani has published six novels and seven books of poetry. He's the recipient of a Guggenheim, the Penn Hemingway Award, the Penn Young Margins Award, the Hurston Wright Award, and the Latin Literary Fellowship, among many other honors. And he's a board of trustees professor of English at Northwestern University, on sabbatical right now to teach the Trias workshop here at HWS. Uh, writer and publisher Dave Eggers has said Chris Abani might be the most courageous writer working right now. If you want to get the molten heart of contemporary fiction, Abani is the starting point. I was lucky enough to get to meet Chris Abani for the first time when I was in graduate school in creative writing at Utah during a particularly formative moment in my career. Abani was a visiting writer and I was running the guest writer series there. I took him out to dinner the night he arrived at the town and that dinner conversation has turned into a, a part of my personal mythology as a writer. We talked about all kinds of important things involving gender, politics, race, academia, poetry, but even more important than the content for me was the model. Chris got me thinking about what it means to be a writer in the world, what it means to be a human being. And I think that's what his stories and his poems give us as well. Not idealized versions of ourselves, prettier, smarter, and never making mistakes, but people who act like people, who sometimes do awful things, who sometimes do extraordinarily redemptive things, who sometimes smoke cigarettes and throw things, who sometimes get hungry, who sometimes get sick, who sometimes get angry unfairly, who sometimes forgive astonishingly and open-heartedly, I feel more human after reading Chris Avani's works. Even, and maybe especially, when the people they describe and their circumstances veer far from my own experience. Some of Chris's most compelling and memorable characters range from an Elvis impersonating teenager in Lagos to a pair of potentially murderous conjoined twins in Las Vegas to a West African child soldier wandering through a war zone to an escaped forced prostitute teenager in London mourning the loss of her mother. There's something about life in these liminal or marginal spaces that shines its spotlight back to the cores of seeming normalcy. There's something about the edge in Chris's work that implicates everything else. So, rereading a book like Song for Night with my intro creative writers this week and finding myself once again reading as I read it for the fifth time, perhaps even more than when I read it the first time, Rereading a book like this with its war horror so foreign to my everyday life forces me to rethink my everyday life. It breaks me up productively. I have to stop and face myself, my own fragile system of ethics that feels so solid to me, my own privilege, my own heart. Yes, I feel more human after reading Chris Avani's work, human in all its complication and nuance and beauty and terror and helplessness and hopefulness. 
And so I'm thrilled to be able to introduce to you one of the most deeply intelligent, witty, important, and human writers I know, Chris Avant. Starts to listen. 
So the captain comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a problem with one of our engines. Uh, unfortunately, there are too many people on board. We have two parachutes. So in the spirit of the new South Africa, we are now going to ask for two volunteers to step up and jump off the plane. And nobody moves. And so he says, well, still continuing in the spirit of the new South Africa, we're going to go alphabetically. For all the Africans on the plane, please jump off. Nobody moves. <laughs> and he says, for all the blacks on the plane, please jump off. And nobody moves. And he says, for all the colors on the plane, please jump off. And nobody moves. So at this point, the two black passengers is a man and his son, and his 10-year-old son turns to him and says, Father, if we're not African and we're not black and we're not colored, what are we? And he said, today my son has Zulus. <laughs> So there was this small college in the south where I read and three white boys in the audience in KKK outfits, stiff like lilies for a funeral. And the walk up to them was long with fear and shame and rage, but I took the hood off of one and I wore it back to the stage and threw my beating to a deafening applause, but I mostly remember how hot it was under the fabric and how that boy smell filled me and how wet my tears were. And being in the warm bed, breathing softly, and me cold on the floor, and writing this poem in an old notebook. And the arrow slit of skylight lets in only a red light. And her Gennadia E translations flutter by the bed like a flock of simple white birds. The more we promise never to leave our lovers, the faster the horizon arrives. 4. There is a place on the veld where elephants go to die. Here they come across the skeletons of other elephants. They pause amid the whiteness, raise their trunks and howl to the absent flesh, circling the bones, picking up each one, putting it down, circling it one last time. They stand still in silence for an age, then move, steps less assured, slower. So why was it so hard to tell my mother I love you? Like the man in Sarah's translation in the United poems, tracing a woman's face with a flower. To cling to death, to a metaphor as real as a dying parent, is to wrap language around an absence. There are stories that can kill you. Histories 1. Boys are taught to kill early. 5. When I shot a chick in my first ritual. 8. When chickens became easy. 10. When I killed a goat. I was made to stare into that goat's eyes before pulling my knife across its throat. Amen. I thought it was to teach me the agony of the kill. Perhaps it was to inure me to blood, to think nothing of the jagged resistance of flesh, to make the smell of rust and metal and shit familiar. I have never killed a man, but I know how. I know I can. I know that if the timing were right, I would. I'm only afraid that I may not feel sorry. I'm only afraid that I will enjoy it. Three, and what can you say about growing up in Nigeria? And does anyone care that you picked plump red and yellow cashews from trees and ate them in the sun, the sticky sweet of them running down your arms? And later, the seed collected and roasted for the nut. And later, in prison, men writing names on their bodies with the sap Names to obscure their real selves, names to protect what might be left over when they return to the world from hell. It is an old trick to fool death by writing a new name on your body. I was afraid my soul would be obscured and in cowardly script almost invisible to the eye, I scrawled with the tip of an eagle, Saddam. It is faded to a nice smudge on my belly where a network of hairs and stretch marks pretend it never happened. I learned alchemy in prison. Words mean only what you want them to. You say sunshine and you mean hope. You say food and you mean refuge. You say stone and you mean clay. Sorry, you say sand and you mean clay. You say stone and you mean I will never forget. But you do, but you do. And thank God, thank God. <coughs> Eight. <coughs> 
When you first see a man die from a machete cut or a bullet, which is to say, when you first confront the astonishment of blood and feel it creep over your skin like a sugary sludge, even though the cracks it wets are not your skin, but really the obsidian of the road, you feel sick in ways you thought not possible. A deep and wonderful bile that can never leave your stomach. And then the days pass, and you become familiar with its ways, and it bothers you no more than cherry syrup dripped over pancakes. You grow bored and impatient with it all, with the shock of those just arriving moments. And after that, people can die around you day and night, and you go on without even noticing. My capacity for it scares me. Blessed are the undefiled in the way. There are two ways to view the body, resurrection and crucifixion. Everything that falls between is ritual. Pilgrimage 1. Nothing as definite as prayer. A hand cups a shadow, a heart is laid bare, open as a flower. Somewhere between care and property, Los Angeles is alive. The city tonight stands outside of everything. We come tonight, we come to light. The city is a liar, may I find my way. Los Angeles is a dream we cannot bear. I think of streets black as any river and beer, and over loud music a woman calls to her lover that there is no truth here. The city is awash with lights, even this sacrifice will not save us. I say hibiscus and I mean innocence. I say guava and I mean childhood. I say mosquito netting and I mean loss. I say father and it means only that. Happen that we all dream that the sea is only sea. Happen that we call upon God that it is only a breeze roughly in a prayer book in a small church where benches grown in the heat. Outside, a peacock will not be quiet. And there are so many ways I could undo the night my father died if I could only find the fascinations of time. And here, the green grass is green even with the abundance of home, even with the weight of exile. There is a tree in my father's backyard under which my umbilical is buried. There is no metaphor here. When bathing on a zinc sheet one night, I sliced my ankle to bleed my umbilical again. Look, there is a simple math to loss, to self, to all regimes. I can sing my father's lineage back half a millennia, but here in Starbucks I struggle with okra to find myself. Which is to say, I could accept the labels before me, but only a deeper cut will suffice. I am not an American, though I want to be. I am not a Nigerian, even though I have the melancholy. I am something deeper still, for now ego, a placeholder. Also, sometimes, druid on my mother's side and a, a red passport. And people say, Christ, if I'd seen what you've seen, Christ, mercy, Jesus. This is my cry too, I have seen, but I am still lost. The fog will not part, no matter how long I strike my staff against stone. There are slavers in my ancestry, slaves to me. And some nights I wake with the bitter of rusty chains on my tongue and the whip in my hand. Avatars come and go and come again. There is only a map fading in the harsh sun. Some may call me a pessimist, but I am not. There is nothing gained from loss. I drink tea in the shade, and I believe in poetry. I am a zealot of the autumn. So, that's the poetry of the poets. Thank you. So, um, zero days. Something I want to do. No, so I watched Dexter. <laughs> oh. So why is it prison? Triple homicide. Um, fairy tale. What possible harm can the story do, you ask yourself as you fetch the small photo of your father from the mantelpiece. You don't have a fireplace, so it really isn't a mantelpiece, just a rickety shelf on the wall. And there, in the small cramped living room, with a bare cement floor painted red by your mother, because, as she says, poverty is no excuse for uncleanliness. 
know how much harm you tell yourself as you nearly knock over the small plastic vase that holds the plastic flowers your father gave your mother on their first date. You have seen her dust around you carefully every Sunday, wiping each petal with a soft cloth while she sings softly under her breath. You write the vase and dash into the kitchen, although even to you that word seems too big for this space. Here, you say, showing the woman the picture. <coughs> she is stirring a pot of beans on the stove in the small kitchen from pantry. This is my real father, you say. I know that for a fact, you insist, even though no one is arguing. The one in the fairy tale you're about to tell is your father too, but you don't say that. I mean, he can't be your real father if he's in a fairy tale, can he? It's just a story, like Red Riding Hood. That isn't real, and telling it never hurt anybody, did it? Although, if the truth be told, Red's big mouth did alert the wolf to grandma, and though everything worked out really well in the end, there can be no joy in being eaten by a wolf, swallowed whole, even if you are old, even if it is temporary. Like the nine-year-old boy in the homelands, the drum magazine says was swallowed whole by a python, but bit his way to freedom right through the snake's belly from the inside out. Tell me more, the woman says. Each time you have lunch, since you first told her the story, she presses you to tell it again. And you want to because she comes to you while your mother is still at work and she feeds you. And you want to because she is your mother's special friend. It's the same every time. You always begin with the photo that is your real father, not the father in the story. Because what harm can you do? And what a rarity, a grown-up who wants to hear the stories of a child, and not just any grown-up, but a white woman too, although that is not immediately obvious when you look at her. She looks more colored than white, but this is South Africa in the 70s, and you can tell for sure. This you understand because your father, your mother is Zulu and your father is Indian, but there is nothing clear about that when people look at you, especially in this land where you are what your father is. But only women surround you. And so there is no clear proof that you are who you want to be, especially since everyone thinks you're just another Zulu brat with a father lost to the mines, the war, the struggle, the bottle, or to all of them. And this story a mother tells is a lie that makes her not the slut she really is. And this photo of a Sikh man in a turban, this photo could not be real. Who would admit to a marriage a relationship that clearly broke the anti miscegenation laws? And you know children are just being cruel when they say this. You know it's not true because your mother told you it isn't, but it hurts nonetheless. And then your mother adopts this strange woman who claims that she is white and brings her home and says, here is your Auntie Alice, even though everyone else calls her White Alice. So what harm telling this story? And like always, like again, she plays with you, this lonely, only child, half starved for attention, she asks, have you ever seen your father? And you say, no, no, but he's a hero, just like the father in the story. And then White Alice says, tell me the story then, Sunil, tell it to me, you know I love it. And she listens, wrapped, moving only to keep the beans from burning and sticking to the pan, and then you begin, long ago and far away, but today and so forever, there lived a brave warrior. And then one day a big ogre invaded his land. He was a strong evil ogre from afar, <clears throat> a land far in the north where the sun hid its face. At first the people said to the ogre, there is plenty of land to share, why not share? But the ogre began to kill everyone, so the warrior fought the ogre, but it was too powerful. And so the warrior fled, escaped to the land of the Shona, a powerful but kind people to the north, and there the warrior made his home, treating other men who also escaped to the land of the Shona, driven off by the ogre, how to be warriors. And where does he live in the land of the Shona, White Alice asks. He lives by a big baba tree, you say, and on an island that looks like a mudfish in a big sea called Kariba. There he and other Impies train and grow strong to become warriors, and they will return soon to defeat the ogre. It is a short story, but with each telling you add detail, the dusty road that leads through the mystical forest of Chete Stafan, which is the name of a powerful witch who protects all who dwell there, the strange civilians who roam free and a powerful medicine men who can fly to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, the reeds by the water's edge that hid the magical fish-shaped island from view like the ones that hid Moses as a baby. And then while you stuff your face with beans and bread, sip and delicately on the Coca-Cola that you aren't allowed, but which is part of your secret, White Alice spreads a map out and asks you to tell her the story again, 
pen points over the map to mark something, and with each telling the map gets more and more marks. And today, like all the other days, she draws lines across the map that has Rhodesia printed on it in big letters. She draws lines connecting the Chetasafan area with the small town of Sibila on the shores of Lake Kariba, looking, searching for an island shaped like a mudfish or a whale. But it is only a story, what harm can you do? And if your mother trusts this white woman who looks colored, and if she wants to hear your fairy tale, then what of it? And then a few days later, you come home from playing to find your mother crying on the floor, kneeling as if in prayer, shoulders heaving, a telegram lying like a dead moth beside her. You know someone has died. That's the only time telegrams come to Soweto. You know better than to ask any questions, better than to approach her. So you sneak to your room and you listen to her prowling and muttering to herself as she deduces the mystery and you hear the terrible words and confirm a fear that until now has sat in the pit of your stomach, gnawing away. How did white Alice know the truth? Your mother asked herself. Was it Sunil? Was it Sunil's story about his father, about where he was hiding that led Alice to the truth? And you know she has put it all together. And you realize that this was no fairy tale, even though she said it was. Said the word in Zulu, in Ganakwani. This was no mere tale. Your father was the father in the story, and he was real. He was the head of an armed ANC faction, launching guerrilla attacks in shopping malls to bring down apartheid. And he fled to Rhodesia to escape, and he was hiding in an ANC training camp on an island. The fairy tale contained the directions, and White Alice finally figured it out on a map why you ate beans and bread and drank Coca-Cola and told your story. And although you tell yourself you could not have known the truth, you know this is a lie because you were four when your mother first told it to you. Because your father left when she was still pregnant with you and you needed the story. But now you are 12 and if what the Bible says about Jesus is true, then old enough to debate your elders in the temple and certainly in Soweto in the 70s, to be 12 is like being 20. But still, there is a four-year-old who misses his father, misses the father he has never seen, and who needed someone to hear his story. This is what you tell yourself. But you hear the terrible whisper truth as your mother prowls the house like a hungry ghost. And white Alice, who was once white but turned colored because of her sickness, white Alice who lost it all, her husband, her kids, her nice house in a white suburb, her white pass card, her privilege, and had come to live in Soweto like a Kaffir, white Alice whom Dorothy had taken in, taken to a fellow of our soul. Alice had betrayed her, stolen Sunil's story, and day by day reconstructed the truth, the truth she sold to the secret police in the hopes of getting her life back, her kids, her husband, her home, her whiteness. And who wouldn't, Dorothy muttered, and who wouldn't, but still, but still. And now her husband and many other men dead, and Sunil without his father, not even a mythical one, and all because of a story, the story in her mouth that told her. She was good at stories, always had been. The last sound you hear that night draws you into the kitchen and you see your mother sitting there, shoulders shaking with sobs, and terrified you approach, terrified because you have never seen her this way, this woman who everyone deferentially calls Miss Dorothy. And then she looks up when you call to her and you scream. And you don't scream because of the mascara running down her face in black witch tendrils or the rouge of her cheeks when you smear with tears and sweat. It is her mouth that terrifies you. She has sewn it shut, the needle still dangling from a piece of black surgical thread, not a mouth at all, but flesh, meat, raw and bleeding. And so you run, run into White Alice's house, and then the men come in an old ambulance and you take her mother, and though there is a murderous rage in her eyes when she sees White Alice, there is also an understanding, a gratitude for this gift of the men dressed in white, and Dorothy looks from you to Alice, and because her mouth is still so shut, the women can only exchange looks. Yes, White Alice says, yes, I will take care of some men. Again, that murderous rage and gratitude, then Dorothy is gone. You were 12. Never tell your story again. Johnny Tenten, who lives down the street at number 1010, says, Do you know why your mother sewed her mouth shut and got taken to the crazy house? But you know better than to answer. You know that children can be cruel. Thank you.
So, it's like Q&A time, right? Mm -hmm. Any special protocol or just things like that? So, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, several reasons. Um, so when I when I moved, um, I grew up I grew up partly in Nigeria, partly in London, but mostly in Nigeria. And I grew up upper middle class in Nigeria. And, and um, round about, I suppose, in the, the mid eighties, uh, the, the military dictatorships got really bad. And suddenly, a lot of people who never had money made money from from illegal contracts and from oil. And so what they would do is that they would all over all the cities in Nigeria, wherever they lived, they would recreate the cities of the world that they'd seen. You know? So, like we had a, an admiral whose house would go like an aircraft carrier, and where the planes would land with his helicopter landed. So, you know, it's like Las Vegas in that sense. So, um, so when I first moved here, like I got here in 2000, and I didn't really know anyone, I knew a bunch of Nigerians, and, and they were like, ah, oh, you've not been to Vegas, you have to move to Vegas. <laughs> so we went to Las Vegas. And I remember just driving down the street thinking, oh my god, it's like a parallel universe. It's like being back in, you know, rural rich 80s Nigeria. You know, because uh, Nigerians are like that. If they see the Eiffel Tower and they like it, they'll build one in their front <laughs> And then they'll just put a light on it, so it's like their street light. <laughs> so driving down the street, I was like, oh my god, this is like home. Um, and, and then it was fine. It's fine thing to go down the street, as you know, because, well, first of all, the street is different different times of year. So in December, there are you know, most of the Christians are Christmas in, and so it's like suddenly it's like all of Asia is there, all the Buddhists are there. And in the height of summer, for some reason, everyone from Wisconsin and their children are there. Um, and there's all this money, and there's all this strange stuff, and there's all this homeless people, it's like jam packed. But everyone pretends to only see this glitzy part of it. Um, so that fascinated me. And then I started to hang out in the casino. And I was like, my God, it's really like the movies. There are these people like, you know, in the casino, like, uh, and they're gambling. <laughs> <laughs> I was really fascinated in this. I walk around and I had a notebook and I'm taking notes. Um, and uh, taking notes always gets me in trouble. You know? And I joined the version of Flames, which is set in a, part of the version of Flames is set in a, a transsexual strip club. I got into trouble for taking notes in the transsexual strip club. <laughs> But anyway, because it was a practice more likely when you take notes. You can take photos, but you can't take notes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was, um, I was walking around and said about 2.30 in the morning, the casinos become very sad places. You know, like most people are either party or going to bed, and then it's just like the diehards, you know, sitting at the table, they've lost all their money, and they're trying to pawn their watches. And so I, I started taking all these notes, and I had been going out the strip, and I didn't realize that the, the, the cameras are all connected and they, they receive from, from hotel to hotel. So I get to about, I think I was like at the MGM and then these two gentlemen in very, you know, because again, all the security wear red jackets so they can spot each other. So like these two, they were very poorly, so it was like, you know, two Father Christmases. <laughs> uh, arrested me and took me to the back and then, you know, so it was like, what kind of number system was I running? What kind of <laughs> And the notebook is there, I'm like, I'm taking notes for a novel and they were like, <laughs> so I was like, I'm taking notes, so this went on for like an hour. And so I said, why don't you open the notebook? It's right there. And the guy opens it and his face, I wish I could have taken a photograph of it. I've never seen anything like it. It's almost like when you open the notebook, you know, there was like a naked cucumber dancing. <laughs> and he, he says to him, Jimmy, taking notes for a fucking novel. <laughs> so Jimmy says, what the fuck is wrong with you? Same guy, um, Al is his name. I don't know if he's been on, you know, sometimes when immigrants arrive from another country, someone can't say their name, they change their name. <laughs> so he was Al, I don't know why he was Al. <laughs> so Al says, have you ever been fishing in the Salton Sea? I said, no, where is the Salton Sea? He's like, okay, let's go to the Salton Sea. And so apparently you have to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning because you have to get to the sea like 5 a.m. because by 9 a.m. it's like 110 degrees. Oh, so we drive there, we've got fishing. I've never fished. 
So suddenly we're, we're in, there's a, just an Indian reservation just before you get to it. And Al says, hey, what, do you have a fishing license? I said, well, I have a fishing license. <laughs> so we go to the Walmart to buy the fishing license. <laughs> and so I'm standing, this is just come from England. And so I'm standing at the counter at Walmart where we're buying a fishing license and all these shotguns. And, <laughs> and so I said to the guy, can I, can I buy a gun? He's like, yeah, you can take that shotgun and leave. And I said, how much is it? Like $50. He's like, what? And then I turned turn around, and right behind me is a special display of all the Barbie dolls. I was like, okay. <laughs> so we get to the Sultan Sea, it's like 5 30, the sun is just breaking. And there's a man in the water. And he looks like, at first I thought he was drowning a baby. Because <laughs> he was holding something. And it was strange, because it's like attached to him, and I thought, it looks like his arms are moving. So I said, I'm just drowning a baby. So, you know, typical Nigerian fashion, we don't need to see, we stand on the, on the back and debate it. No, I'm not. But if it's drowning a baby, the baby would be dead. Oh, if the baby's dead, why would you need to so we're having this conversation and there's a bunch of other um, people, not Nigerians, who are videoing this apparently baby drowning. So finally the guy turns up, this is got his backwards, and he sees us and he's quite literally, he must have been maybe 65, and to say a man is beautiful, it's hard, he just had this long grey hair, really, there's just something really elegant and he saw us and you know his face is clouded over. And he just walks out, and as he's walking towards us, I realize he's been trying to hang him on his side, a parasitic twin. And I was like, and so everyone's like, <laughs> <laughs> even the big people filming it, you know, they're holding their cell phones like this. <laughs> <laughs> because it, you know, well, I grew up in Nigeria, and, you know, if you've been to certain, you know, America has done this thing where they've vanished away all kinds of physical disabilities. And only occasionally in Starbucks you're going to someone in a wheelchair and everyone pretends that the person's not in a wheelchair while they're making, you know, they're taking forever to order. Everyone is like looking at each other in line like, oh, but then they're smiling. <laughs> and I always found that strange, this in Nigeria, if you're taking too long and you are disabled, you someone just tapping, are you going to order or what? <laughs> and, you know, and as a kid, I used to say, that's awful. And I said, why? His brain is not the problem, it's his legs, so he can't order. <laughs> <laughs> So it's like it's this whole sudden relationship to the body, like that sudden disgust fascinated me. Um, and so I watched this man get dressed, and then I'm feeling really shitty now, so I go over to talk to him. And so he tells me, I know he's from the rise, and he was born this way, and no one knew what to do with him. And, so, and it was, you think about what it would have been you know, 60 years ago, there probably wasn't a lot that could have done for him. So I became fine, and then right then I thought, this is, I wrote the first line of what became the book for four years before I finally realized that it wasn't going to work, and it was, he wasn't drowning a baby. Mm -hmm. So I said this thing at the salt and sea, there's nothing at the salt and sea, except dead fish. And the fish just die, you actually don't need to fish, they just die and throw it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I was looking through notebooks after like six months of trying to make this work, and I found the biggest book. And I thought, oh, well, why don't I just move him to Lake Mead? And then everything sort of fell into Vegas. And the other thing, too, is that Vegas is, for me, one of the, it sort of marks, it's a place where all of America's contradictions were revealed. Because, you know, in America, the, the myth of freedom that isn't actually here. It's Vegas. Vegas is all about total freedom, but it's all run by this tight security. You know, like, and all the, the whole idea of whatever you do here stays here. So it's sort of, in a way, it's America's subconscious, but now it's like a whole world subconscious. Because, you know, I don't know if you know, it's the second largest uh, port for all um, trafficking of young women into sexual slavery. Well, Atlanta, apparently, is the first one. Maybe it's the second. Almost all the cartels come there to do their drug deals because it's like shangri la it's like, you know, no man's land. It's like the DMZ. And so I started to, and then I started to spend a lot of time in Vegas. And, you know, outside of the strip, there's a whole lot of it. And that Vegas to me was more interesting. And so after a while I started to think of, if you think of those old movies where you see the cowboy sets and his fronts, that's how I see the strip. It's just literally like cardboard fronts and like the real city is happening behind it. And once that happened, the story started to click into place. And then I, I started going out to the desert to do research and you know, all those roads you turn off and then suddenly a truck pulls up and heavily armed men tell you you can't be here. Kind of stuff. <laughs> 
And they're like, is this Area 51? And they're like, you can't be here. <laughs> and so I just sort of got fascinated and talented, you know, you know that town DT? So I went into this band, and it's like, you know, oh my God. Anyway, we're trying to get into Jesus, but I became fascinated by desert people. And then I met the downwinders, and then I just saw it. So it became the perfect place to set a story about apartheid and redemption, because it allowed, it allowed me to talk about not only the staging of a whole other kind of international heart of darkness, but it actually begins to reveal really frightening things, you know, all the nuclear testing that happened six miles from the city center, all the casino bomb parties, the Miss Atomic Bomb contests, all of this stuff. So, I mean, how can you not want to write about Vegas? It's an amazing place. And so I, lo I love it. I mean, I can only stay there for days at a time. I can't like, extend it. I don't think I can handle it. But I really like it. So that's why Vegas is the perfect city. It's like Tokyo, it absorbs all the Vegas. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Would you mind talking about your time as a local person? Um, I don't talk about it. It's been such a long time. Um, so, but there's a book you can read about it, kind of which I probably can tell you more than I can. Um, that I wrote. But um, briefly, I, I, I used to be a young activist and spent a total of three years on and off different times uh, in prisons in Nigeria for. Um, for uh, literary activism. Yeah. If you ask him a bit more directed question, you get an answer. Because that's like, you know, we'll be here all night talking about my three years of the No? Anything in particular you wanted to know? No, I just remember from your TED talk that there was a particular individual who was, I can't remember anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. John James. That's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, John James is an amazing kid. Um, John James was 14, and he was arrested because his father was wanted. Uh, and he used to arrest people in Hawking with ransom. So this is a military regime. Uh, until your father, his father never turned up. And it's either because he didn't know his son was being held, or you know, the more complicated reason, of course, you know, it's being that he didn't want to die uh, in his son's place, or he thought they would both die. But John James, <laughs> This is a maximum security prison. You're, you're not housed with other political prisoners. You're housed with murderers and rapists and really bad people on death row. And John James decided to one of the things that really, really touched me about him. So he was so young that the guards used to give him, let him have comic books. And, and one of the things he do is teach these prisoners how to read using you know, Spider-Man and Batman. And, <laughs> it's just fascinating to watch uh, human spirits in certain places. It's, it's, it's like I, I once went to, I, I, did, um, I talked for a while in a prison in Durban, South Africa called the Westfield Prison. And the death penalty was repealed in South Africa, so everyone who was on death row is now in the open life in prison. And when you get into that section, there are people who are so far gone that they're actually uh, in cages, like animal cages, they're locked in these cages on the ground. And they, they can barely move in them because if they're let out, I don't mean, they they just attack people and kill them. So sitting in death row, in this death row, uh, doing random poetry workshop, and, and with, with this other South African poet, James Matthews, who's like four foot eleven and ninety pounds. I mean, it's like Bruce Lee would look like you know the Hulk next to him. Um, and he was quite an old man, and we're sitting there, and suddenly no one can find this public, and everyone's terrified. Like the alarms are going off, and like walk down. And, and then they find him, so these cages are facing each other on this, just an alley, a little alley, and there is James sitting in the middle. Like, basically they reached out, they could, they could scramble him. And he's sitting there on the floor, reading their poems. And these guys who, when we came in with their back the cages and screaming, are all quiet, just listen. That, <laughs> that's one of the most powerful things I've ever seen in my life. So. Um, Prison, prison is an intriguing place. Strange things happen there. And yeah, that goes behind over here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, recently, in class, we've been talking about um, that and the features and how one is the aestheticism of politics and one is the philosophism of art. I was wondering why you feel like you call it on that spectrum. Um, 
So it's funny because I at least gave a talk recently, a couple days ago, um, in Nebraska, and we were sort of talking about this whole idea of things. And you know, my training is as, an, as, a, is as an academic, and so I'm fascinated because when we're talking about that stuff, we're talking about textual bodies. Um, and the, the difficult dialectic that always one has to navigate with this is as much as I believe in words and I believe in language and I believe in, in ideas, they are ideas. Um, you know, because of that, that early in the visit when I was there, uh, someone had said, you know, he felt amputated because of all the technology he had to deal with. And, and, and it's like, well, yeah, but so what does a child in Sierra Leone say? Because he was really amputated. And so it's always for me, I'm always negotiating this difficulty between what I think of as a more academic and intellectual relationship to these ideas and, and a real bodies in the world that have to confront these ideas. And the danger of only looking at the intellectual side is that we unwittingly become collaborators with what happens to real bodies. So after, do you know about the Civil War in Syria? So what happened is that the rebels started chopping off the arms and legs of people, their own people, basically people who supported the rebels. And so after the war, when the UN went in and there was all this debriefing going on of the captured rebel leaders, really emerged, really frightening facts began to emerge. What it was is that throughout the war in Syria, they felt that England, Germany, and America in particular had refused to respond to sending aid or armed interventions because only combatants were seen to die. So they intentionally started hacking off these arms and legs of children to drive the international media, to drive world governments to intercede. This is one of those unfortunate places where that intellectual and real estate start to open up in terrifying ways. So I, I, I all, of, all of that is, for me, it's always, so because I was trained, I mean, I have three graduate degrees, so I'm trained as an academic, I'm trained to be a critic, um, but I'm also someone who, by virtue of birth and, and, and just the nature of different kinds of work I do, I end up in places where it's, all of that is of no use to me. You know, it just gets, you, 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 you meet someone who tell you just with one sentence tells you something. Like I was in Saudi Arabia doing some, some research and, and I had a guy and she was maybe 21 um, and she was obsessed with washing her hair. Like she washed her hair four or five times a day. So it's like, what the fuck, right? <laughs> and so it's about the war. Um, she didn't wash her hair once a month because the, where they were was in the direct line of the snipers. And to get water, just to cook, they had to cross through the lines. And we're talking about a modern European state. Just so you, you know. Um, and so when you start to, and I had gone in there to talk about this little project around what was called the Roses of Sarajevo, which is where all the mortar blasts that happened, they filled them in with concrete and painted them white so that the explosion looked like a flower. And so I had gone into a poetry project around this that was all sort of arguing about sort of the, the slippage that occurs and it's something you're confronted with real bodies and so so for me, it's always a struggle. Um, and so whichever way we land on it, uh, I think the most important thing as a thinker is one to always bring rigor to your thoughts. And so it's all, it means occupying a very difficult space because we, whichever side you subscribe to, you have to be open to the fact that the other side has a position. And whatever these two sides of any particular kind of academic conversation you're having, you should also always be aware of the back of your mind that this, just down the street, just down the street in, in Geneva, I drove by some houses the other day and it's like nothing like this side. But there's always two things happening simultaneously. And it's not that the guilt is useless. I grew up Catholic, I can tell you right now, <laughs> it's the most useless emotion in the world. And because, you know, I, I was born privileged and I, I lived among people who were not. And so it's, that's actually in many ways guilt is a, is a more disrespectful way of engaging the lack of privilege because there's no people who don't have things don't really begrudge people who don't have things things or they begrudge is the invisibility that those things render to them. Like, in other words, the, the, the Alexis isn't the problem is that when you're in Alexis you don't see who's not in Alexis. So so for all of that just to say just try to live with a little bit of um, the dialectic.
and, and, and what we do is when you're arguing a critical paper, make sure your research is tight. <laughs> <laughs> and in the middle of that, don't be introducing dead bodies from Sierra Leone. It doesn't help you get a name. <laughs> oh, so it's really it's like just approaching things with a bit of a common sense, but always allowing yourself to understand that whatever, whatever you are studying, whatever you are confronting, you know, you should always realize that everything is working in registers and to allow yourself to experience all the nuances of all those registers. But please don't put guilt into it because all that does is it, it negates your own suffering. You know, I'm writing a book of essays now, it's part of what I'm here, on how difficult it is to be an American. And it seems like a strange thing to say. But an American identity is the most difficult thing because one really you knows what it is. So in many ways, American identity is so linked to consumerism that a Nepalese man, in many ways, who's watched the same movies you have and makes the whole is as much an American as you are. But often what happens is that the perceived privilege, and I'm not only talking about material privilege, but all ideas of privilege that are associated with Americanness, often creates a strange disconnection where Americans are not allowed to experience their own pain. So just because someone lives in a suburb and has three meals a day, doesn't mean they won't suffer psychic pain. And so we get caught up in these hierarchies of pain that are redundant and useless. And rather than forcing a kind of compassion and empathy, they actually force a distance because we start to get this compassion fatigue. You get tired of feeling bad for everyone else when you've got your own shit to do. So really what I'm asking you to consider is the, the issues are none of the things we think they are. All it is is just trying to always be aware that you are surfing through a complex universe. And that's all, that's all that's required. Because that alone is really, really hard. You know, I don't know if that answered your question at all. I hope it did. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, we're back. Um, how, would you say that, how would you say living in like several different countries has affected your writing and like and know yourself, I guess? Um, well, you know, the thing about, about writing and, and writers is much of who you're going to be as a writer is usually set by the time you're 12. Really, truthfully. It's all influences that you have from when you, when you first started encountering text. Um, so I started, my mom taught me to read when I was three. Um, and I just one of those people just was good at it. Like when I was six, I used to do my brother's homework in exchange for cigarettes. He was nine. Just had three other brothers. Um, but I, I, I grew up in a very. But my privilege is not only a financial one. It was because there are lots of people who grew up with that. We don't grow up with intellectual privilege. Um, both of my my father went to Oxford in the fifties. Uh, both of my parents were, were, were readers. They, but they loved debate. Like the, the local imam would come by every Sunday and hear my dad read these blistering rows about how St. Paul stole everything from Muhammad and all the, you know. But by the time I was 10, I had read things like the Bhagavad Gita, I had read the Quran, but I was reading comic books, right? So I was reading The Silver Surfer and Batman. I had read Baldwin, I had read, uh, because my mom would say, here's, here's, um, here's Animal Farm, I want a book report. He's like nine years old. And he used to sit there. My brother Greg would like be out playing soccer and I'd complain. He'd be like, well, that's what you get for being a smart kid, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that had as much more influence because even till today, I think that all my protagonists, and I said this before, contain the existential melancholy that the Silver Surfer has, a chicanic rock from Crime and Punishment, and Rufus from another country. Books that I read as a kid, TV shows I read as a, that I watched as a kid have as much influence on me. The thing about living in multiple countries is what it does for you as a writer is it lets you start to learn to live outside of your own neurosis. So the, because all writing is driven in many ways from our own neurosis. It's, it's, in, you know, it's in a skip, but it's a very selfish profession. But what you hope is that you start from yourself and you start to encounter other. Um, and so what that has done for me is, is um, learning to navigate class, race, Etiquette. Um, like in England, no one gives you their phone number and they say, Why don't you call them? When I got here, everyone would give me their phone number, like, call me, call me, or hang out. You call them and they're like, uh, Yeah, so I'm busy. And I was like, What do you think? I can never buy Just those kinds of differences start to force you. And the other thing I, I 
love about living in different places is, is simply the idea of collecting accents. If you collect accents, English becomes so pliable that you can start to do things with language, you can start to tweak language and meanings that creates such a, a variance within one line. Or you like to be wondering one lyric line and hit five octaves, that kind of thing. Um, so that's what living in all these countries has done. It's kind of forced me to be to start to think less in, in national terms, less even in historic terms, but more in terms of human terms. How do I as a human being connect here? What does it mean? And if I stripped away all the uh, so I tend to treat human beings the way I treat novels. So like you know, if I was teaching how to write a Harry Potter book, I'd say take away all the magic first and the sort of relationships. You know, so that's what I do when I meet a person. I take away all the stuff that they're walking, they're coming at me with, and then actually see them much clearer. I do find out that most people are the same. You know, it's very sad. I think the Buddha must have been a tired traveler. He said like we're all the same. Um, but I think that's what it's done. It's, it forces you to be nuanced in a way you don't always have to be if you don't travel or live in multiple places. Because you, you're only talking to people who have the same experience as you. So you don't really have to work for it. Does that make sense? Don't forget that we have books for sale over here, and I hope everyone got a copy.